Welcome to South Orange Library's lecture series, Special Conversations. I'm so excited to be here with Ben Gray, who is a South Orange resident, most importantly, and also writer, director, and producer of the hit Wondery audio drama, Blood Ties, which stars Jillian Jacobs, Jillian, not Gillian? Gillian. Oh, Gillian. Gillian Jacobs, Josh Gad, and Christian Navarro. The show premiered in December 2019 and spent 12 days at number one on Apple Podcasts. Since then, Blood Ties has received an iHeartRadio Podcast Award, a Podcast Academy Award, an Ambi, and a Webby, all for Best Fiction Podcast of the Year. Ben has also written for several other popular Wondery shows, like the Whitney, Whitney Cummings-hosted miniseries, Bunga Bunga, as well as American Scandal and Imagined Life. Currently, he serves as the senior producer of Wondery's award-winning series, Even the Rich. Before he started working in audio, Ben was the editor of several award-winning documentary films, like HBO's Emmy-nominated Jane Fonda in Five Acts. Please join me in welcoming Ben Gray. He, uh, uh, as you can tell, he's the perfect person to talk about the podcast industry and crafting audio storytelling. So, take it away, Ben. <laughs> well, I think you know one of the one of the things that I want to start by saying is that you know this this talk is about podcasting. It's about how to tell stories in audio, but a lot of what I'm going to say is applicable um, to many different media and um, and I hope even for people who aren't writers or filmmakers um, or podcasters I hope that this some of what I'm sharing uh, helps you appreciate or enjoy some of the stories that you're seeing on TV or on, on film so let me queue up. I'm just going to dive right in with this is the cold open to episode two of the first season of, of Blood Ties. And I'm going to try to get of Blood Ties. And just a little bit of background to set up the scene. Um, Eleanor and Michael Richland are the adult children of a billionaire healthcare magnate who has just disappeared in a plane crash in the Caribbean. And now they are getting ready to, um, uh, to take their mom's body back to the States. And their dad's body has not yet been, been found. And he has disappeared under mysterious circumstances. I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, Michael. Elle, relax, all right? We, we just, we need to get home and deal with all this. Just get on the plane. I can't, Michael, I can't. I can't. What? I can't get on that plane. I, I, I can only really fly commercial, let alone just a, a tiny little propeller thing like that. I can't do it, Michael. I cannot do it. I'm going to lose my mind. All right, all right, all right, all right. Look, you just walk up the steps, sit down, close your eyes, and go to sleep. It's not that easy for me. I'm not like you. Well, then here, be more like me. Michael, Advil's not going to help. No, that's just the bottle. It's Percocet. It'll help. I promise. You know you can lose your license for that. Really? For giving my sister a few Percocet to get over her fear of flying when her parents just died? Grow up, Elle. Take the pills. Michael, what are you taking these days? Oh, stop. Eleanor, I'm a trained certified cosmetic surgeon with the legal right to self-prescribe if that's what I want to do. Now take two of these and get on the plane. In ten minutes, you are not going to care about anything. My 
parents are dead. The Times is sitting on damaging information about my dad, whose body is somewhere under the Caribbean. And I'm on an airplane. I haven't been on a plane in four years. Last time I was on a plane, I had to be tackled before I opened the emergency door at 30,000 feet. Jesus, you could set your clock to those breaths. So calm. So even. That's modern medicine for you. Nothing it can't cover up. episode we throw you right in in a, in a cold open and what that does is it forces the audience to really lean forward and engage and figure out where they are what's going on put together the pieces um, as the action moves in front of them so they feel like they're trying to trying to catch up um, we use cold opens at Wondery for every type of show I've ever worked on nonfiction, single host, two hosts, always that kind of, you know, immersive moment where you just drop an audience in and and let them figure out what's happened since the last episode, if it's a if it's a you know a multi episode arc. But the one thing that you need for these stories to to work and particularly in audio is you need a main character. Right? So, who from listening to this would you say is, is our main character? The woman. The woman. And why would you say the woman? Um, I suppose because the only like first person perspective we got was hers. Yeah, she has the voiceover, yeah. right? Um, in a converse, so in a, in a conversation-based podcast, it's the host. It's really clear that it's the, it's the person who has direct access to the audience. And that's really important um, because it's the strongest, most, most direct link emotionally for the audience. It's the strongest point of entry into the, into the story. But it, it's also one of the few ways that we can quickly create empathy and a, and a, real, and a real connection. And that's because we can't see these people, right? So we don't have close-ups, we don't have their eyes, we don't have, you know, um, a particular, particularly evocative setting, you know, a haunted house or, a, you know, industrial wasteland or think about any kind of genre movie and how it leans on certain visual tropes to tell you, oh, this is the kind of story that you're in, this is the, this is the kind of world that it takes place in, this is who you should care about. Um, so, I think that a lot of people, when they knee jerk, when they look at fiction audio, they see that as a um, as a weakness of the medium. But I would say that it's actually a significant strength because that lack of visuals is what gets you engaged in the in the story. So if you if you think about it, what you just heard. Whether you realize it or not as you're listening, you know what Eleanor looks like. You know what the plane looks like. You have all these images flashing through your head based on just the few cues that we're giving you to kind of you know, stimulate your imagination. And so um, we provide you just the bare minimum, just enough to, to, get, your own, to get your own imagination going. Um, it's usually just characters' voices and a few sound effects, and then you guys are doing the rest. And that's, for me, the most magical thing about fiction podcasts is that, you know, so you take a show like Blood Ties, you know, millions of people have listened to this show, and they all have a different Eleanor in their head. They're all picturing something different. It's, it's kind of similar, like, it's similar to what you, the, the, the relationship that you have with your readers right. in a book right. where 
despite what whatever descriptions you might give, audiences tend to have an idea based entirely on something else. Maybe it's an interaction or a, or a scene about what the character looks like. And so people get very attached and they get very engaged and, and very invested. And it's what makes fiction podcasts fun to, to listen to. Because you have to listen and you have to imagine. And it's really lovely. And you get to add your own details, you get to add your own, you know, bring your own creativity to it. So for me, the exciting thing about my relationship with a fiction podcast audience is that we're kind of partners in this. You know, we need to, we both need to be present and engaged for this to, um, for this to work. So you need to keep imagining, and in order for you to do that, you need to keep listening. And this leads to the toughest thing about audio. So to get you to keep listening, I have to get over um, the obstacle of how people listen to podcasts, which is that they're on the move, they're in the car, they're laying on their horn, you're flicking off the person in the car that just cut you <laughs> cut you off. You know, your phone call is cutting into the into the story. So more than any other medium that I've ever worked in. We have to be really, really disciplined and super tight about how we construct our stories to, to keep people plugged in, give them ways to get back in after they're, after they're um, distracted, you know, and the element that is the, for me, the most important thing is uh, conflict and creating compelling, evocative, conflicts that will keep people engaged. Now, okay, so, you know, in dramatic narrative, people have been trying to define conflict since Aristotle, and it's never really super satisfying. So I have a way that I think will demonstrate what conflict is, and that is by showing you its absence. And so I'm going to summon Laura, who's the, who's the the leading lady of the South Orange Public Library Players. <laughs> and we're gonna do the scene you just heard with no conflict at all. Okay? All right, okay. go ahead. Whoopsies. Uh-oh. Eleanor, are you afraid of flying on an airplane again? <laughs> yes, I am. It's my fear of flying. I also fear many other things in my life because I lack confidence. Oh, in that case, here, have some of my drugs. I'm still addicted to them, so they car I carry them around in this Advil bottle. Mmm, thanks for the drugs. Should we go? Yes, let's go take our dead mom home. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I think you, you can tell we're going to go back in a second and we're going to listen to that, to, that, to that scene again, and you'll, I think, appreciate some of the layers of, of conflict, but... Um, I think we can all agree that is a horrible scene. Nobody <laughs> wants to listen to a half an hour of that. Um, no. <laughs> maybe in Mystery Science Theater 3000 or something. But, um, but it's basically, all it does is it just blah, lays out all this information. Everything you need is laid out like a bad hotel buffet. There's nothing exciting about it. Um, so let's... Let's listen to the to that scene. I'm just going to play the first part of it again, okay. and hopefully. Do it. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't, Michael. Elle, relax, all right? We, we just, we need to get home and deal with all this. Just get on the plane. I can't, Michael. I can't. I can't. 
What? I can't get on that plane. I, I, I can only fly commercial, let alone just a, a tiny little propeller thing like that. I can't do it, Michael. I cannot do it. I'm going to lose my mind. All right, all right, all right, all right. Look, you just walk up the steps, sit down, close your eyes, and go to sleep. It's not that easy for me. I'm not like you. Well, then here, be more like me. Michael, Advil's not going to help. No, that's just the bottle. It's Percocet. It'll help. I promise. You know you can lose your license for that. Really? For giving my sister a few Percocet to get over her fear of flying when her parents just died? Grow up, Elle. Take the pills. Michael, what are you taking these days? Oh, stop. Eleanor, I'm a trained, certified cosmetic surgeon with the legal right to self-prescribe if that's what I want to do. Now, take two of these and get on the plane. In ten minutes, you are not going to care about anything. Okay, so even if you couldn't catch all of it, that, there, that exchange is basically all the information that was covered in what we just did, but it's full of conflict. There, you know, Eleanor can't even admit what's happening in the beginning of the scene. She's in conflict with herself. She can't admit that she can't get on the plane. And then she won't tell her brother why. And he has to get it out of her. And then he waits to give her the Percocet that he knows is, will, will help her because he doesn't want to reveal that about himself. And it's just layer on layer on layer of, of conflicts of varying scale, right? Um, even the, you know, even the the way that um, the way that the the Advil bottle plays out is just its own little micro conflict. He holds out a bottle. She says, "Advil's not going to help." And he says, "No, it's not Advil. It's Percocet." That's a that's a that that's a little mini conflict that just makes the back and forth a little bit more uh, engaging. And in audio, I'm always looking for ways to load scenes up with, with um, little micro-conflicts like that because they just keep things feeling tense and you know, keep the story momentum going forward and most importantly keep people, uh, keep our listeners engaged after you've been you know, cut off or you're next to somebody who's man-spreading on the subway and you have to like go sit in a different <laughs> seat or something and then you hear these people fighting on the po on your podcast they're having a little mini fight but then you're like, you're like oh wait what's what's going on right. people are fighting what's going right. on <laughs> um so so basically with all of that in mind i'm going to give you a um a kind of okay rule of thumb that I use about conflict. Um, I think it's it's not spectacular, but it's better than most, and that is that um, good good dramatic conflict. A, a good story is going to have somebody who wants something very badly and is having trouble getting it. So it has to be big enough to be worth wanting and worth persisting, and the obstacles have to be equally. Large, So it can be money, it can be self-worth, it can be some kind of validation. In this case, I think it, a, l a lot of um, the conflict in blood ties uh, uh, involves the truth. You know, after the, um, after the father disappears in the plane crash, um, a New York Times reporter calls Eleanor with um, teasing damaging information about her dad. And so there's a lot of tension around, is she going to engage with that? Is she going to learn more? Is she going to put her head in the sand? Is she going to ignore it? Um, so for Eleanor, the thing she wants very badly, I think, is to prove her self-worth. And she's constantly being told to stop asking questions. She's been told to stay in her lane. But she wants to know who her father actually was. And she wants to know the truth about him, and in turn, the truth about, about her. So that's her, that's her goal. So the first couple of episodes of season one revolve around that whole, that whole question. And then we get to the end of episode two. Oh, 
but we're just going to do it right on here. Is that? Yeah. That's enough. Whatever they were going through, whatever issues they had in their marriage, or whatever. I don't want to know about it. Every married couple has issues, hell. They're gone. And all that stuff can go with them. Okay. All right. That doesn't give you the right to throw a computer across a room. You know, you can just walk away. Okay. I will. Michael, wait. Michael! Growing up, I'd lay awake at night listening to it ring every 15 minutes, waiting for my dad to come home from work, ready to run down the stairs the second I heard his footsteps, ready to ambush him from five steps up and then breathe deep on his aftershave as he carried me back to bed. God, I love that smell. It meant everything was okay. Dad was home. I could sleep. Lots of nights he didn't come home. He was a busy, important man. I knew that. And those nights, I stayed up with that clock, wide awake, waiting. Where was he? The last thing my mom ever sent me was a text message. It said, something's wrong. Your dad is... My dad is... What exactly, mom? What is he? It's midnight, by the way. Merry Christmas, everyone. Hello? Connie? I'm ready. Tell me where to go. Okay, so that's the end of episode two. So I'm playing this for you because in the it's a six episode arc, and I think this is one of the most important episodes in the one of the most important moments in the season, and also just broader structurally, it's an important moment that happens in almost every story that um, that's basically where you make your deal with the audience, right? So. There has to be a moment in every story where the, the protagonist or the hero and the antagonist or the bad guy, the obstacle, um, become inextricably linked. So what does that mean? It means that there's no going back from here. That was Eleanor agreeing to meet with the journalist who has damaging information about her dad. And she cannot, once she hears that information, her life will never be the same. There's no going back from there. Up to the moment when she gets that information, she could keep going, she could just go back to her normal life. She could decide, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pay attention to this. I'm, I'm a very wealthy person. I can afford to shield myself from this in many different, many different ways. Um, and then she can just keep on, go on, you know, living in ignorance of the things that her dad has done. But once you hear them, you can never unhear them. Now, when you're telling a fiction audio story, that doesn't, it doesn't always have to be the end of episode two, but I'll just quickly tell you guys why for us it happened at the end of episode two, and that is because in a traditional um, podcast release, in a, in a uh, you know, six to eight episode arc, you're gonna drop your first two episodes simultaneously. So this is the moment where the audience has, you know, I'm reasonably confident in our abilities to, um, to get people from episode one to episode two, because it's right there for them, they can just keep listening. From episode two to episode three, they have to wait a week. So what you end episode two with is very, very important because that's where you really want to make the deal. You want to say, this is the story of a woman who is not going to back down, and no matter what she finds, she is going to find out the truth about who her family is, and in turn, who she is. Um, and if you're interested in that, you'll come back. You'll come back next week. Okay. But that also creates a problem. Because 
if the tension in the first two episodes has been around will she, won't she, is she going to engage, is she not going to engage, then we just let a lot of air out of the balloon by saying, yes, she's going to engage with the, with the journalist, right? But you also can't tell a story if you don't have these resolutions along the way where your characters make choices. So, so you, you kind of have to choose, like, is this a two episode, is that it? You know, after two episodes, and she goes and meets, and everybody's, everybody's you know, that's, everybody's fine, she feels fulfilled, her, her father did horrible things, but it's great. But you know. we want to know what horrible things he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're with so there's definitely the promise of there's definitely the promise of more information. And she definitely feels like she's getting closer to her to to her goal. But what happens when she gets all of that information is that that solution becomes an even bigger problem. So, she gets that information She, um, she tells her brother what she's found out. And he doesn't see things the way that she does. He doesn't remember them the way, that, the way that she remembers them. He doesn't remember their father the way that she remembers her father. And all of a sudden, she has, via her brother, woken up all of these very, very powerful forces that want her to stop talking about this, stop looking into this, cover it all up, to the point that she's putting her own life in, in danger. So what felt at the end of episode two like a mini resolution has actually created this much larger problem that's going to push us all the way through to the end of season one. And that's basically, that's the, that's the game. When you're telling stories like this, and it's important to be mindful of it and to know where you are in that cycle of conflict and resolution and then resolution becoming a problem mm. and creating new conflicts. Also, the solutions are always false solutions because you find something else out. Um, that's how we drive these forward and on a show like Blood Ties there are no final resolutions. I mean we're starting season four now and it, it just is, it's kind of like you end a season, and then when you come in on the next season, you reveal the trap door that you didn't know was under the end of right. the previous season, so that you can keep, so you can keep pushing the story forward. And that's not just you know, that's not just audio. It's, I would say that it's even more important in audio. I believe that good fictional audio stories should be very very tight, and. And, and very clear, and even if they um, evoke complicated emotions or they build situations that are full of layers and nuance, that they build it out of clear, simple parts. But this is true of any story. I mean, this will work on the people you like to drink with. <laughs> you know? It doesn't, any, any time you want to tell a story, or you think of you know your own your own family stories. If you think back to people you know who are great storytellers, they're they're using this. It's the twist, right? It's the but dot dot dot. It's like you thought this, but, and that takes us into a whole other. And that's how you know you can keep that engine running for for as long as for as long as you want to. And I um I mean I encourage all of you guys to. To try that out, tell some tell some stories. I mean, it's it's a it, even if you're not gonna you know publish it or yeah. put it up on Apple Podcasts or it, Kurt Vonnegut when he used to go to schools, he used to tell the kids if you want to be a writer, write a poem, it can be short, and then tear it up into eight pieces and distribute it in eight different garbage cans. <laughs> <laughs> There's just you know, there's just a pleasure in the telling uh -huh. Uh -huh. and in the doing of it. You don't even you don't even need to you know you don't you don't need a publisher. You don't need a big crew or anything like that. It's just fun to it's just a fun thing to do. So I encourage everybody to um, to try it. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, <laughs> um, I was wondering. I love. I know we're talking about 
fiction podcasts, but you also work on non-fiction yeah. podcasts, and it seems like some of the same, you use some of the same techniques, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We always, so I, um, I did a mini-series about Silvio Berlusconi um, in 2020 called Bunga Bunga, and that had, it wasn't always the same protagonist, but we, it was a complicated story and a sprawling story, but we always knew and were always really clear whose POV we were in in each moment of each episode, and there could be multiple protagonists of, you know, um, it, you know, it could be one person in Act One of an episode, it could be a different person in Act Two, but, but we were always really careful to make sure the audience knew whose perspective we were telling the story through in that moment. Right. And, yeah. like, the way you reveal information, too, incrementally, there's a lot of suspense in that, too. Yeah, and again, it's the it's the same thing. I mean, this is the story of a man who had um, he had business problems. He thought that being elected prime minister of Italy would allow him to you know solve his business problems. It just created more scrutiny on his. Does it sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> yeah. uh, it just it just created more scrutiny on his businesses, and it made him ra have to ratchet up the measures that he was taking over and over again. And you know. Um, so again, it's like false solution, false solution, false solution, wow. yeah. Um, so this works, this works for, um, for nonfiction, for single host, even The Rich, uh, which is the show I'm producing right now, is multi-host. And we even have, just in the relationship between the A host and the, and the B host, you know, you have an A host who's driving the story, you have a B host who is, who's written to know nothing about the story. Mm -hmm. And it creates these little moments of conflict. You have to have, you create a back and forth. Is there a little bit where you need some, you know, you need some nuance about, like, the Kardashians, and oh, is it that Kardashian or is it that Kardashian? It's like, oh, well, that's where the B host would, like, get confused and ask a clarifying question. There would be a little, it's a little bit of, like, mini, mini conflict yeah. just to, you know, to, to keep things, keep things moving forward. Right. I guess one of the things I was noticing as you were playing those clips, especially in the last one, listening to that clock, you know, the use of sound effects, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. It's so, it seems like it's so important, you know, you don't have visuals, but you have like the sound of the plane engine, mm -hmm. you have this clock kind of counting down to when she's going to make her choice. Yeah, and also, I mean, that clock is, that clock is super important in all of season one because from that moment where we tell a story, once we tell a story about it, mm -hmm. and we anchor it to their home and to her childhood, then every time in over the six episode season, we are going back in that into that house. At some point early, you will hear the sure. you'll hear the clock in the distance somewhere, oh, so that cool. we don't have to have anybody say like like the version of the scene that we just read. Yeah, we're like ah, back at the <laughs> old family manse, you know, <laughs> like in the middle of some like tense like sequence or something. You know, they don't have to call it out because we've established an audio marker yeah. for that for that location. And we try to do that as much as we try to do that as much as possible. Right. Without being too obvious about it. Right. I mean it is minimal. You know, it's just the one sound and it's so powerful. So it's something that you think about a lot when you're producing, right? Because I know you produce this also. Mm -hmm. And then so as a producer do you figure out like, okay, what sound are we gonna have? Do you put it all together? Well that happens in collaboration with our uh, sound designer, okay. Mixer, who's a very talented guy named Jeff Schmidt. Okay. And, and so the grandfather clock is an example of something that was written into the script to yeah. serve that, to, to serve that purpose. But the, the sound designer also will bring a lot of ideas for just you know, audio that'll get in your ear, like it'll just, it, it resonates, it sticks with you, so that the next time you hear it, you know where, you know where you are without realizing that you know where you, that right. you know where you are. Right. 
And where did the story come from? Did it start with you? Was so it, the, the yeah. story came, the story was um, Marshall Louie, who's the chief content officer at Wondery, had this idea about this family and their um, famous father and his and him having Me Too allegations coming out about him posthumously. And then um, he shared that with me. And then I kind of built out an outline. And then from there, the, the outline got greenlit, and and then went then we went into into writing. That's the way the process usually works. Okay. With us, uh, what I'll say the the really interesting thing to me was that it really clicked when we realized that this needed to take place in the medical world, in the world of medicine, because um, I felt strongly that it had to be uh, the dad's money had to come from from medicine because. What was popular on Wondery's platform at that time? It was Dirty Dr. John. Doctor Death. Yeah. Doctor Death. I listened to that. Bad, Doctor yeah. Death. Bad, bad batch. <laughs> I mean, that was when Wondery was like the place to go <laughs> for like Medical. shady physicians. <laughs> and this yeah. is. Wait, is that when the psychiatrist who owned the house? Uh, the shrink oh, next door. The yeah, shrink yeah, next door. Yeah. Again. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, no, this was all like 2019, 2020. Um, that's what that's what Wondery was doing, and 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 this is the thing about fiction, there are n there are not yet enough listeners who come to these platforms looking for fiction, mm. for us not to be mindful. This is my opinion. People would disagree with this, but for us not to be mindful of what people are listening to in the nonfiction mm. space, because when when I write something, like I want people to listen to it, like as many as possible, like why. I'm like, why wouldn't you? You know, um, especially in this in this in this medium. Like, if I felt differently, maybe I would write poems or something. But um, but I'm I do podcasts, and I and I want as many listeners as possible. And you kind of have to give people a a premise that feels like a a podcast with a capital P. And in most people's minds, that's still a nonfiction true crime. Podcast, or it's something that fits into one of the other, you know, genres that that do well in podcasting. So at that time, it was like the medical thriller. So we we made this family a medical family. The brother is a shady plastic surgeon. The dad is a the, the dad is a shady shady medical bill, like billionaire, you know, inventor of a you know of a heart of a heart valve for it's a yeah it's a, a heart valve for um for. Uh, for premature babies. Oh. Yeah. And do you think more people are, it seems like fiction podcasts are becoming more, more popular, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, ev everybody is, is making them Yeah. now. I mean, you know, DC, Marvel, Universal. I, really... I, I mean, okay. everybody, has a, everybody has a podcast arm as a way of, you know, leveraging their IP in yeah. in the audio in the audio space. Because right. obviously they have a lot of stories. They can't tell them all with film and television because it's just too expensive. And this is a this is a way for them to tell mm -hmm. to tell some of their mm -hmm. some of their stories. So yeah. and it's been a there there has been a dramatic change just since twenty nineteen when the first season of Blood Ties yeah. came out. I mean there's I just so, so many so many more. Do you think it's partially because of the pandemic and people are doing lots of audio? I don't know why. Okay. I just think it's, I think it's like anything else. It's a great option. Yeah. Like you want something to listen to. Yeah. I think it's yeah. something that people were slow to come back to. You know, the audio, audio dramas are nothing new. I mean, right. Like the 30s and the, and, the, and, the, and the 40s, you know, with the old radio plays mm -hmm. were really wonderful. Right. And, and, and back then, you know, when the third man was a hit as a film, this they didn't do the sequel and for for film. They did the sequel on on radio. So it was almost like when you went up the food chain, then you went up to radio. So it was just a very different relationship between audio and 
you know, and, and visual entertainment. It's really fascinating. Yeah. But for whatever reason, people were slow to come back to the fiction side. Yeah. But I think that's changing. I think it's really just a really good idea and a really yeah. fun thing to listen to that people are just now discovering. Yeah. I have to go back and check, but the last time I looked, fiction, like if you click on in, in Apple Podcasts and you try to choose a genre, fiction was like below government. Oh. In the like <laughs> in the like drop down menu. I'm I hope I'm gonna check it again tonight. This was like a couple of years ago, but I hope they've moved it up a little bit. Like I just heard this piece on NPR that they're gonna do Arthur. The Art Arthur oh. as a podcast. Oh really? If for kids. Want, for kids. Yeah. You want to start to oh, that's cute. It's been a huge and I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, and the the point is like to have families listen together. Uh, right. Arthur. Yeah. Yeah. Fiction's moved up. Yeah. Fiction's moved up. You checked it. This is equal with religion. Oh, <laughs> that's actually really that's good. good. Just below history. That's, that's great. I'll yeah. take it. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Religion does really well on, I mean, if you look at the top 20, there's always um, does that include the Bible the interpretation. Okay. Oh, no, I, I'm not, I'm talking about actual earnest, earnest religion, religious not, podcasts. Not, not, the ones, not the ones, not the ones I about to. Jonestown or something. <laughs> okay. uh, that counts as religion for me. Um, does anyone else have questions for Ben? Well, I came in late, um, so you probably went over how you made the, I don't know if you made a transition, but you must have transitioned from somewhere. <laughs> oh, into uh, audio. Yes. Into audio. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. That's my next question, Carla. Thank you. Um, I, I edited uh, documentaries for, for 10 years, and that was what I, um, what I did out of, out of grad school, and I loved I loved doing that, but I was also doing a lot of writing on my own, and I was writing screenplays on the train on my way into the city every morning, or I would be getting up at 5 a.m. to write before going into work, and um, and I wanted to get into writing, and I found the you know the barriers to entry to to screenwriting are are very very high, but I was on a trip out to L.A. to you know meet with a manager or something, and I also happened to call up an old friend who had just started working at Wondery, mm -hmm. Marshall Louie, who's oh, okay. chief content officer there, and he was like, well, come write for us. And, wow. And it was the perfect... And that must... When was that? That was 2018. Okay. Not that and that was when they were scaling up. They desperately needed writers. It's funny because it was very similar to my experience starting to edit documentaries in 2009 right when documentaries were starting to like blow up and people just needed that. If you, you know, had a pulse and were in the room, yeah. you would get it, you could have a, you know, that's crack it like a HBO documentary. Yeah. Um, and that's what podcasts felt like for those first yeah. couple of years where it was just like. What about someone trying to break into the industry now? Do you think it's more challenging? We still really need good writers. Yeah. There's never, I think, you can never have too many yeah. good writers. And how does someone go about that? Can they like approach Wondery directly, or do you need an agent? You definitely do not need representation. You can you can approach anyone uh, anyone at the company on the editorial side. Yeah. Directly. I mean, I get emails. So oh, I have a friend whose son is graduating from you know. Pass it on to yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Do you think it's gonna that's gonna change at some point? <laughs> I I hope not. I yeah. don't think so. You know, podcasts are it's it's a it's a wonderful space, and I I love I love working in it. But part of what keeps it part of what keeps it real is that it just doesn't like the film and TV money isn't right. in podcasting. It's not, these people aren't making seven figures for right. like a hit right. podcast or something. Right. You know, setting aside the like Joe Rogans of the like, oh, yeah. you know. Well, are advertisers, uh, you know, coming to podcasts? I mean, you have to stay afloat, right? 
Well, I think they've they've been in they've they've been in in podcasts for for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a I think it's a great way to um, it's a great way for them to to reach a, a captive a captive audience unless you hit that fifteen button. Yeah. You were saying uh, when you you kind of wrote an outline and that was green lit. I was interested like how many episodes was in that outline and also how far ahead were you thinking as a writer of like second series, third series, how am I factoring this in? Uh, whether you think like if the second series gets commissioned, I've left the track door and I'll figure it out mm -hmm. when I get there or I've already kind of got a rough idea of where I could take it. So So the outline, I always knew it was going to be, it, it, that each season was going to be six episodes. Mm. Um, I find sometimes with, you know, I find that I, I over, that I um, catch up to my outline very, very quickly. So when I outline something, what I thought in the outline is going to be in episode four is actually winds up somewhere at the end of episode two or maybe in episode three. And then... And then things get really fun because you have to figure out the story because you kind of run out of track like too early. And I mean, I say fun, it's a little unpleasant. <laughs> but at the same time, I do think that it like, the excitement of discovering how to, again, it's just like you need more, more false solutions, more yeah. conflicts, more resolutions. You, maybe you take a more circuitous path to something that you thought was just going to be a, a straight line, but but then you're kind of experiencing the thrill of figuring it out as you're writing, and I actually think that 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 translates to audiences. Like audiences can feel that they can feel writing that you were excited about as you as you wrote it, and that you're like barely staying ahead of the story yourself. For for a show like Blood Ties, which is very much like a page turner, you know. Um, we want it to be like a like a premium cable soap opera, mm -hmm. like move fast, have lots of twists and everything. I think that writing like that always, always, always translates. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, the the kind of structure that you follow for Blood Ties that you describe, you know, which has which is similar in a lot of ways to to screenwriting. Is that something that marks Wondery? Is that like Wondery's brand, and that's why you stand out from other podcast companies, or do you think that's true? I think it's probably used across audio. I mean, I think the cold open is like a pretty standard audio device. Yeah. And and they use it on on television a lot yeah. now. Also, I mean, yeah. it used to be like a thing when somebody did like a cold open, but yeah. now it's pretty now it's pretty it's 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 pretty standard. I mean, sometimes you get episodes on. Um, on some of the premium platforms that just like you just don't even do credits. You just dive right in. You know, you just dive right in and maybe like twenty minutes in there might be credits or something. You know? Um but I think yeah the, the the three act structure that we use is very traditional and has been around for a really, really long time. Um and I think a lot of it is also just a lot of people use it because it's necessitated by the ad breaks. Mm. You know, we need to, you know, we, we write cliffhangers in because we need you to like get through a minute of Simply Safe or hair dye <laughs> or something like that, and we don't want you to like to give up on us, so we always have to end on something really impactful. And I think that's a universal yeah. of the of the medium. I mean that's something that Unless you're doing, people have started doing more like binge releases where you'll drop like all all six episodes at once, mm -hmm. probably be, usually behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, ads yeah, ads aren't going anywhere. Yeah. And as long as they're around, then you're gonna have this you're gonna have this this structure. I like podcast ads because I can just go thirty <laughs> seconds after, skip right through them, which you can't do. And so. I had an idea once that I wanted to sneak ads in that were relevant to the story. Uh -huh. Like I wanted to like write an ad for Richland Health Services <laughs> into, oh, that would be great. into the ads for. Oh, that would be great. I know, and it would have it was it was really like 
it was really diabolical because it would have made people force people to listen to the yes. ads because there might be like a story that's right. twist that's that like or like cool. a news report or something from you know you should do that they never took me up on it season four they didn't, they didn't take they didn't even write uh. back <laughs> Un unanswered email what about uh, casting I mean you know I always wonder who's auditioning for audiobooks and you know how how does that work well so. I think it, it depends on the show. I don't know how it works for audiobooks. That's a space that I've never that, that I've never worked in. I'll tell you that Gillian Jacobs and Josh Gad are both very, very experienced, uh, very established actors, and they are um, they're not people who read for parts. Like they don't audition for parts. You go to them with your script and um, and hopefully they you know respond to the material and they and, and they say yes and that's most of the actors that we work with on blood ties even even down to the smaller down to the smaller parts um, so these are actors who work in film or TV you know, film and television yeah. Okay. yeah how long does it take from like ideation to the point of release and also you were saying like we when you're talking about writing, are you writing, are you talking about Wondery as a company, or are you actually writing with a partner or others the way you're... No, I'm talking about Wondery as a, as a, as a company. Yeah. I, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that I, I think one of the reasons why I love audio so much is that I love the people that I work with mm. so much. And, you know, um, Marshall is, uh, is somebody who uh, always gives me really good notes and is just really kind of cuts through some of my BS and places where I overwrite or am too taken with my own idea and, mm. you know, um, or comes comes in with his own ideas, you know, when we're kind of stumped. So when I say we, I mean just podcasts are very collaborative. Mm. There, there, are always, there are always different people looking at things, responding to things and all of that. Um, and you enjoy that, right? I love that. And it's as you're even at along the way it's not like you turn something in i mean yeah no, no i mean we're I, yeah i post stuff and yeah. let people know that it's up and then and then people and, and then people you know people respond i like one thing that i like about blood ties that doesn't happen with with a lot of other shows is that i can always take the notes back and execute them myself, myself oh, right which i really like being able to do yeah why can't you do that for other? Just workflow. Uh, you know, I'll do my pass yeah. on. I'll do my pass on a script, and then it'll go to, and then it'll, and then it'll go to to to, to somebody else who will do who, who will do their pass mm -hmm. on the script, and it just keeps going until the, end of the last passes. The hosts, for example, with the rich. So, yeah, right. um, so you're part of the you're you're part of the process, but you're not. Yeah. But you're you know you're not the writer where things keep coming. Coming back to you. Right. Yeah. The other question was how long it takes animation to oh, right. So, season one was our most luxurious schedule. That was March. I did the outline. Christmas 2019, it came out. Season two was. During the was during lockdown, basically what happened in audio, um, in audio and at YouTube. My wife works at YouTube, so we, our house was kind of insane because we were both we were both having deadlines pull up instead of you know just to fill like we were the only people who were still going. <laughs> so season two, I had to write season two really quickly. I don't remember how. Yeah, I think in a couple months, two or three months, and then mix, and then that was one where we mixed it, um, as it, we mixed it as it as as it went. Like each week, we were finishing the mix on Thursday, and then it was dropping on Friday. So that was super. That one was really fast, but again, we were just like the pandemic was just like. You're just trying to get the content. Out. Try to get as much content out, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, they said recording kits to people to the actors' houses, right? In their closets. Yeah, everyone did it from their everyone did it from closets in their houses. The the the, the audio team at Wondery sent these massive kits to everybody's houses to build basically sound studios in their in their homes, and then we had a sound engineer 
for each actor monitoring their levels remotely and so they could catch anything. And it was, it was a really elaborate, really impressive setup by the Wondery sound department. How big were your teams and what's the budget like that you worked with to create this? I can't give you a budget, but I would say, so usually the cast is like 20 to 30 people per season. And, um, and, then, uh, and then at Wondery, if you want to include marketing and, and all of that, I mean, I've been on marketing calls that have like 20 people alone, <laughs> you know? So it's like, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's a lot of people. There are a lot. I don't want to give a number because then it's not going to include yeah. some very important group of people that I've just never interacted with. Like, <laughs> so it's a lot. And 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 we're like, I feel very fortunate to work on a on a show that's that supported, because obviously marketing is huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes such a big difference. Like, yes, you have to tell a good story, but it certainly helps to also have like a group of people who are working really hard just to get it out there and like make sure people know about it and everything. So. Do they advertise mostly on other podcasts or at least if, at first kind of introduce it on other Wondery podcasts? Other Wondery shows, but also all, all over. All over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a and there's a particular, you know, expertise to doing that. I know season three which just came out, um, was had a spot on, on um, Smartless, which is a, a very popular um, uh, Jason Bateman, mm -hmm. Arnett, you know, so that's more of a... And the New York Times does, like, my favorite podcast, they'll do, I don't know what the section is, I can't remember. Yeah, they'll but do they'll lists. like five. Yep. My favorite podcasts yep. this week are, mm -hmm. I always write those down. I know, <laughs> yeah. Those lists are huge. Any last question? Or? I, I have one. Yeah. Uh, in terms of um, you know the staffing of the writers and editors and things like that, um, how much of it is contract or freelance versus staff? So on the editorial side, like yeah, on, like the people who are like behind the scenes, I would say most most of the people who work on the show are full-time employees mm -hmm. of Wondery. I'm a freelancer. Oh. Yeah. But most of the people that I work with are full-time employees. But they hire me to write, direct, and produce different So you different also shows. work on other projects? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm certainly open to it. But there has not, since I got into audio, been a point at which I haven't been like so busy yeah. that I could even, right. you know, think about it. But yes, if there wasn't like so much wondery work, yeah, it's possible. Season four, tell us about season four. Is season four? I'm, I am planning to start thinking about season four in January. Okay. I have other stuff. <laughs> right I thought now. you said that it was you were you were starting to record it, but that's. No, we, no, we, so season four, this is, um, this is tentative still, but yeah. season four is probably not gonna, um, gonna drop until the fourth quarter of 2023. Okay. So we have a, we have a little time. time. Yeah. So I'm just letting it, it's doing its thing back there. <laughs> That's right. And, but I, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll start, I'll start uh, outlining it. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank um, you. We have our next program is next Thursday, actually, um, November third at six, with three really great writers from Montclair: Marcy Dermansky, Lori Lico Albanese, and Catherine Dykstra. And we're going. It's National Novel Writing Month um, in November, so we're going to talk to them about their novels.